Hey, Unicorn Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Unicorn Perspective. Today's guest is Dave LaRue. Dave's a, a guy that both myself and Jeremy have known for for probably five or six years now. Um, we've done business together. We've uh, we've helped him with his marketing. He's helped us with our personal development and and growing as business owners and people. Uh, Dave, you know, he, he does a lot of stuff. He owns a very, very large chemical company. He owns a very large coaching company called the comic club. He owns a lot of different businesses. And, um, and, and the comic club is really interesting because it's all about the, you know, quarterly retreats, similar to what a coaching program would be, but much more intimate and high level. And it's all about how to be your, you know, your best self. How can you improve yourself? How can you be happier? How what does success actually mean to you as a human being, as an entrepreneur, as a you know a friend, as a brother, as a son, as a husband, whatever that might be? Um, and so that's why I was so excited to have him on the show because he has such a unique perspective. He's a guy that can come into a room and instantly make everybody happier, instantly make everyone feel more motivated, more inspired. Um, just by his presence, but let alone when he actually speaks and says amazing stuff and, and wisdom. Um, so we sat down, we spoke for over an hour, and we covered a wide range of topics. We covered the you know kind of current state of the economy, what's happening socially. We talked about how to develop as a as a owner, as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, uh, just all amazing stuff. How to develop yourself, further activities you can do, what's most important in your life. Um, so, so much wisdom, so much guidance. I always get a ton out of our conversations. I always lead these conversations more motivated than I was going into them. So I know you're going to be super motivated um, by the end of this episode. So enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. All right, Mr. Dave LaRue in uh, in beautiful Canada, just flying in and, and gracing us in his first day in quarantine with us on the uh, the episode. Thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me, Max. So I told you like when we before we started that this is there's no scripted questions we dive right in and and there's something i just just right out of the gate i've been having a conversation with uh with a few people close to me and one specific last night and i was curious to get your thoughts on this because you're somebody you've achieved massive success in your career you've you've done good things you live this you know great life where you're happy and you've it's not just about money for you. And I obviously we'll get to that and what success means and what purpose means and all that at some point in this conversation. But what I was curious about is for, for entrepreneurs, where do you think the, the tipping point is when money stops being a, a primary driving factor in what you do in terms of accumulation of money? And just, just to preface that, the, the reason I asked that is, I was having a conversation with a friend and I just found this interesting concept where most of us work our entire lives to make money. Most people that's, they want to make more money. They want to make more money. And then there's this point where you look at Bezos and Buffett and Gates and people where now they've dedicated their entire lives to giving away their money. You know, they have entire companies and organizations. Kind of. Kind, kind, of, kind yeah. of. Yeah. To, yeah. to a degree. But I mean, they, they set yeah. up entire entities designed right. just to how can I, you know, donate my money most effectively and invest my money most effectively. And I just found that that concept interesting. And I, I don't know if there's an exact dollar amount or there's an experience level or there's an age level, or it's just totally random. But I figured I got to ask Dave this question because I'm really curious to get your your thoughts on it. Yeah, it's, I, I love the I love the thought about it because um when I was um, a young boy and uh, didn't have a great childhood, uh, in fact, by a lot of standards, it was you know one of the happiest days of my life was when my my old man left when I was 13 years old. Uh, I will also say that uh, you know people say, well, how do you feel about that? And I go, well, you know what? He he taught me a lot of things, but the most important thing he taught me was how not to be. And and I've really used that as determining my values as I go forward. And I'm thankful that he's actually created that awareness for me. I would say when I first started thinking about being an entrepreneur, and uh, I think, I don't know if you're necessarily born with that. I mean, that's a whole discussion. Maybe yeah. we want to, you know, go into that a little deeper after we go through this. But, you know, my solution back to, you know, when I had nothing, had no money, my, my solution was if I earned a lot of money, that was the answer. If I created success, that was going to bring me happiness and money was going to bring happiness. And you wake up one day and you, you start to have more, you start to realize and you start to ask yourself some questions like, 
well, you know, I'm still not that happy, you know I mean? And I, ha I can do more and I can choose more things to do, which I love choices. I love freedom. In fact, freedom is my favorite word. And so from an entrepreneurial perspective, I always get it where when you start to earn more money like that, I always say when people say that I make more money and I'm making more money and I want to make more money, I always say people who make money go to jail. <laughs> Being an sure. entrepreneur, we have to we have to learn how to create value. We have to learn how to give people what they don't have. And then we do that and we create a service or we create products and that creates a need and that creates them buying from us or using our intellectual abilities or whatever it might be. And so there's a side, there's a there's a transition what what for me that I went through that it was all about the money. And then I realized, well, it's still about the money. And I always say to people that tell me or when if you meet me for the first time or sometime in there and it's say like you and I have known each other for several years now. And if you said to me, you know, Dave, it's not about the money. I will grab my wallet because it's nine out of 10 times. It's about the money. So people who say it's not about the money, it typically usually is. So it's always a takeaway. And when people say that, I always put my antlers up and I pay attention. And one of my favorite readings that I wrote, read about, uh, not favorites, and it is not necessarily my favorite business person in the world, but a guy by the name of Richard Branson on the Virgin Airlines yeah. and all the rest of it is, he had a really good explanation for smaller businesses. So a lot of the people I'm dealing with, super successful, a lot of, you know, a lot of success that, you know, from both from, you know, a material standpoint and, you know, the things that they're doing in their lives. But what Richard Branson said is the big donations and that social obligation, the big companies should be doing a lot of that. So when you mentioned the Gates and the uh, Amazon and those guys, you know, they have the wherewithal and they actually have kind of a social responsibility because of their impact that they're having and of all the value that people are creating for them by buying their services and giving them, you know, and so it kind of goes with the territory. So for me, I always look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective, like in my one business, Baldwin Supply, we have, I think, 12 locations. So we're in, you know, seven states, I think, somewhere in that area, maybe eight. But in each location, we're investing in creating jobs, we're investing in buying real estate, we're investing in bringing services into that community. And I feel good about that. And I oftentimes think as entrepreneurs, don't give ourselves credit or enough credit for what we already are creating. And so I really always like to, I love the question because there are a lot of your listeners that probably are small business people. You know, they might have themselves in their own business and they might have two or three people. But then this new thing about the virtual offices and how many people that they actually connect with, you know, and not necessarily full-time employees, maybe, you know, the 1099 employees or the contract employees, but they're still having a huge impact on the, on the communities and society. So that's kind of, um, I got off topic a little no, bit. No, this is great. Yeah, when I look at it, that's I feel really great about what I'm personally doing in the communities that I'm, you know, that we serve and the markets that we go into, et cetera. And what my my evolution or my growth over the years has been for me to really hone in on I love making a difference in people's life, whether they're on my team and their associates and the businesses we have, if they're people that I'm coaching. If it's people like you and your partner, uh, Jeremy, and, uh, you know, when I'm touching and having touches with you guys, I like to be able to make a difference, right? And it's, uh, I don't have all the answers, but talking with smart people, you know, I always say great conversation will lead to great thinking, great thinking will lead to great actions. And you can't have great actions without great thinking, right? And so that's kind of my the it's not I'm not giving it all away. That's what it that's what it is to me. Life is pretty simple if we but we can make it complicated. And I meet a lot of entrepreneurs that are making it way too hard. So I, I love that. Um, and it's for for me it's been a a big thing. So I've been resistant for a long time to actually, you know, sitting down and and 
thinking, right? Like when I say thinking, I mean actually like going beyond the surface level of what do I want and why am I doing things I'm doing? Um, and I, I don't think a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people think beyond the immediate needs, right? So it's it's a lot of entrepreneurs get into it. I want to make money. And that that's their driving force. That's right. their why. That's their what. And it's it's always short. It's I want to say always short sighted, but a lot of the time, especially for people getting started and up to their first few million, it's what can I have? What can I buy? What can I get? What what I find interesting is the the delusion to some extent of the the thinking and like if I get this next thing, it's going to satisfy me. Right, the the materialistic yeah. thing, and it, it, yeah. it blows my mind. I had a really great conversation a week ago or so with a buddy of mine who's been very successful, and we dove really deep into this topic of, okay, if I if I can just get a Bentley, right? We were talking about you know Bentleys. If I can get a Bentley, I'll be so it happy having that work, car. By the way, yeah. and what's what's <laughs> yeah what's what's amazing is is uh, is if you get that thing. And then it makes you happy for, let's say, a few weeks or a few months. You want to drive everywhere. And then eventually there's a point where it's like, crap, I don't want to drive anywhere today. Like, it's no longer exciting. And then it's instead of realizing that maybe things don't achieve happiness, it's I just need a better thing, right? It's this this constant loop where it's always on to the next thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and just to, to get to the point here, like, you know, I don't know why that is. And I want to get get your thought on it. But for me, I was doing some like journaling the other day and just writing down my last like 10 years, like looking back in the last 10 years and really writing down like where I was 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago and today. And that puts so much of a perspective. I think a lot of us were so focused on tomorrow and what we can get. And we don't look back at like where we were and how bad yeah. things could be, how little you had. And and it put a lot of things in perspective for me. So I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, what are, what are your well, thoughts on entrepreneurs? Like why, why do more entrepreneurs not, not think like that? Well, one of the things that, um, there's a bunch of great thinking in there, Max. I take it wherever um, you want to. I just yeah, mind dumped a bunch I, of stuff. I would, I would say that, you know, my number one thing, um, that I really try to coach, um, I'm a unique coach in the sense that I actually am a guy that coaches lots of people. I've been in 80 different countries um, coaching really successful people. And, but I'm also a business guy, you know, and I'm good at it. And a lot of times, you know, the, the two of them don't go together. You have a great coach or you'll have a great business guy. I happen to be pretty good at both. And what I always try to encourage people like right now, my sense is that you're present. I know you're a busy guy. I'm a busy guy. Who cares, right? Only us. We care and about ourselves that way. And so when people come to me and they're, oh, I'm busy, I got to go, and they're not, they're not present with me, I have no time for them. So the key for me in having, you know, that, that really peace and harmony, you know, really being grounded is wherever I'm at, that's where I'm at. So today on our call, I've scheduled enough time. I don't have people. I mean, somebody might walk by because I'm up in my cottage up in on an island. But the uh, you know, the, I, just wherever you're at, be there. So the 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 joy of being present. So people with kids, people with their spouses or their partners, and they they have a tendency you know they're not present and then the other issues start to creep in but if you're truly present there's going to be really great relationships there and frankly the older you get the easier that is to do at least if you're working on yourself and you have it your values are to always learn and grow because you don't want to waste time the 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 challenge younger people i don't know if that's politically correct to say it that way anymore yeah, i have people, no yeah. clue but the, you know, you get in your 20s and, and nowadays, you know, I'm 63 years old. I'm going to be 64 in a couple of, so I'm 64. I'm 64 July 26. And, you know, so time is really important when you get older. I mean, you, you think, wow, I mean, geez, 10 years go by. 
when people are in their 20s, they say, well, you know, the new there's somebody who's there, there's a, a great speaker. And I usually don't bring it up unless I can remember the name. But she did a TED talk and it was about age. And she was talking about the millennials today can kind of postpone their 20s because the the, the new 50 is, you know, the old 60 and the new yeah. 40 is the old 50, you know. And so there's time. And, you know, in the sense is that we kind of sail through it, then all of a sudden you wake up at 30 and you go, oh, what just happened? Right. And so I really want to get people to have that awareness of time, not to be so anal about, you know, whether I'm there, you know, and just because that's not a likable quality. But you've been with people that are just not present. Right. And they're just they're already off on something else. And they ask you a question and not make an eye can't or they're looking at their watch or they're doing. And it's like. I don't want to spend time with people like that. So if I was advising or coaching to the listeners and I, even for myself, I have to remind myself of this stuff, you know, you learn it, but it doesn't mean you always have it. It's easy to slide back into some old habits. And that's the other thing I always like to remind successful people have successful habits. Yep. So I'm in the habit of being present. And if I can't be present, then like today, if I would have said I had a conflict at, you know, some point, I would have said, I'm going to have a conflict for five minutes here. Can we live with that? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm not afraid to communicate that. So that's really one of the things. And then you touched on the clarity and the vision or the purpose. And so that's always evolving when we have a second i'll grab out my master planner that i've used for myself for i don't know 28 years every quarter and maybe you should pull it out sooner rather than later so a lot of your listeners will know how crazy i really am because when you and i were talking before the the conversation i said you know you said something i said yeah max but you were you're, you know, you're grateful for the, you know, you have appreciation and gratitude for the success that you're having and you feel good about it. And what did I say? I said, I've never met a lazy, lucky person. You did. Yep. You know, you've, you've made a lot of that. You're, you've made a lot of your own luck. And so I'll get that a lot because people want to feel good about themselves. Maybe they are jealous. Maybe they're competitive, whatever they're in. They go, oh, Dave, you have this, this and this. And I go, yeah, but I've never made a, met a lazy, lucky person. I've worked really hard especially early on in my career and then i continued to work hard but i got a little smarter as i kept going forward so i didn't just plow and work hard i also put some thought into it i put i got clarity of really where it is that i was trying to get to and go to who i wanted in my life who i don't want in my life all those things i just got much more clarity vision whatever you want to call it but that really helped and then my one of my highest values is being present. I really started to take inventory of what really makes me tick, what I really love. If I love to drive a Bentley and I love the car and so on, that's great. But I always ask the deeper question, why do I want to do that? Is it to have the strangers that see me in the Bentley think, oh, wow, that guy's a really successful guy? Or is it because I just like the quality of a Bentley? Or is there something else behind it? You know, and so I go a little deeper with that. And, I, and I'm trying to really, as a person and evolving and making, you know, I'm still trying to, you know, I always try to have happiness and harmony. But you have to work at that. And so when I get caught on other people's game, right, that's their game. I always say, am I playing my game or I'm playing their game? So with a clear vision, clear purpose, then we can make better choices. That makes sense that I, I kind of bounced a little bit, but it makes complete sense. And like I said, before we started the, the whole reason why I, I structure things like, or don't structure things at all is so we can talk about whatever we want. Like that's, that's the beauty of this. I, you know, if we went down an hour tangent talking about one topic, we would do it right. It doesn't matter. Cause it's, it's interesting to me. And if I think if it's interesting to me, it's going to be interesting to, to yeah, for sure. people watching. Right. And at the end of the day, if it isn't, then like, I want to do this because I want to talk to you and I want to have a great conversation and whatever comes of it comes of it. The, the stuff that you do, and, and I, you know, probably when we do the intro, when I shoot the intro, this, I'll talk a lot more about this. Um, so people watching this now probably already aware of this, but I'm still going to talk about it. You put in a ton of work and the people in your coaching program put in a ton of really hard work digging deep into themselves right and and it's something i've 
I've been not res- resistant might be a strong word, but I've struggled with over the years of like committing to doing that stuff. Um, and it really is until the last few months that I've started actually taking that seriously and having, you know, a whiteboard over there with, you know, what's my goal for today? What am I grateful for to all, you know, the things that you've been talking about yep. for, for a very, very long time. Two, two full question. Like, why do you think it's so difficult for, for people to do these activities? Why are they so resistant to them to make them really like a habit um, beyond maybe they go to the retreat once a year or once every few years and they sit down in the retreat and the, the person makes them do a, you know, a little chart to fill out. And then two, like, do you, do you really believe that this is something that like all successful entrepreneurs and just when I say successful, I'm not just talking monetarily, but also just fulfillment wise and happiness wise do and have in common. Um, another great question, Max, the, um, it's, you know, the, the, the thing that, um, I look at and I touched on it already is I, I think it's really, really important to understand what your highest values are. So I love freedom. It's my favorite word, by the way. And I ask people, it's a fascinating little concept that I do. And I, then I'm in a workshop and I say, I want you to write down the word freedom. And I have 30, you could, I'll give you 30 seconds to write down five words that you associate with freedom. I've done it in front of a group of five people and I've done it in front of, I think the biggest group was 2000 that I've done it. There'll be less than 5% duplication on the other five words. Which is amazing. Isn't it amazing? You know, sometimes depending if it's all like financial services guys, you know, they might all have, you know, what they've been trained and programmed to think about, you know, wealth, it gives you freedom or whatever. But what I've discovered in there is that what we typically write down on a word like that is what we really value. So I value freedom a lot. And it's like, and part of the words that I write down when I write down the word freedom would be choices, wealth, love, family, because that's what freedom, I have more time to do that with the people. So I have really good clarity on that. And so freedom is expensive. And I'm not, I'll go into politics if you want to, What's, but it's, it's nothing's expensive. Off it's, it's expensive for politics too, for freedom. And I think we're, we're, some people are missing that a little bit, but for our own entrepreneurial freedom, if you have great cash flow, like one of the words I associate with freedom is predictability because people go predictability. I go, yep, it's one, it's my second favorite word because if I have predictable cash flow, predictable revenue streams, predictable income, if I have predictable relationships, great relationships and effortless relationships and people that inspire me in my life, guess what? It might sound boring, but predictability gives me all kinds of freedom. And so when we look at that, I always come back down to, again, clarity and vision comes from when you connect that for the entrepreneur, it will come from having a great sense of what you value. And so you ask, why don't people do this more? Because it's, you know, it's difficult because you know what? It's hard work. It's really hard. Successful people have successful habits, but good habits are hard to, you know, to work on. And some, the experts somewhere along the line said it takes 21 days to create a great habit. I kind of disagree with that. I think sometimes it takes a lifetime of work to create that good habit, a lifetime of focus and ability. And so when you can finally start connecting the successes that you're having and success just isn't money, it's having a successful marriage or partnership and in, in your case, you have a successful marriage, you have a successful business partnership and you have, you know, and, and being a successful dad, being, you know, doing that, what it, it's not just about the money. Yep. And I think people, that connection where well, your first question is people always say, well, I'll be better at that when I have the money. I don't think so. I think you get better at it when you make that a point and you, you really strive to have that. I will say one of the quotes I use, and again, it's I can't remember who said it, but might have been in the uh, AA in 19, the 1950s, and the Bill, Dr. Bill, or the guy who started of the AA program, he um, uh, he said um, that um, your eyes will see 
and your ears will hear what your mind is looking for. So you better tell yourself what it is you're looking for because those people will show up in your life. Those actions and different things, you'll hear what your mind is hoping to hear. And, you know, so my daughter just celebrated uh, 12 years of sobriety. Which is awesome. And so I got, yeah, it's great, right? And so we went through that and that experience. And that thing, when she was going through all her hardships, trust me, that was one of the things that I used. And the other thing is go as far as you can see. And when you get there, you're going to be able to see a bit further. And so for the young entrepreneur, as you're setting it, don't, there's, it's not over. When you, when you reach a place, you know, those goals are great because you have to, you know, then you should reestablish new goals, right? And your new goal might not just be to earn more money for the sake of having more money to spend, but it might be to have more impact or influence or make a difference in the community and different lives. So you can set goals that are going to allow you to do that too. But never, ever at the expense of your small business. And that's where I said about Richard Branson. That's his point he made. He said a lot of small entrepreneurs feel this social pressure to go out and to do all these things in the community and do that. But usually in a small business, the small business needs them more than the community needs them. Because if they don't take care of their business, it will go away at a certain point, right? And so... um, I think and that was the clarity and vision, the highest values. One of the biggest breakthroughs for me personally was when I started to hone in on those highest values. You know, then I can ask the question. And again, all great actions come from great questions. I can ask the question then, how is this going to help me or serve me or the people in my life to for I can, you know, you know, enjoy more of the things I value. Right. I, mean, I can ask, day, you yeah. know, I'll do the, Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's that's what it really comes down to, right? It's a lot of what we do day to day is a means to an end. And that end is, you know, being able to live what we value and and achieve our goals and our dreams and our ambitions. And there's, you know, a lot of paths to, to get there. Um, you know, it was... And I don't, I know if, if you had something to say there on that topic, let me know, because I, I it's going to totally do like a, a 90 degree here. So I'll give you that, that minute if you want. To Mike, I, I love that. I love those. I love about faces, too. I love it. I'm going to reach back here, Max, and see if I can find this little uh, uh, my little uh, your, your sheet plan. I normally would have it out this time of day, but I uh, been um, just got up here. And so I don't know. You can see this. Yep, can see you it. You know, you're not going to be able to read it. Yeah. But that's the front, and that's the back, and so, and it's things on there. What I want to get done, highest values, habits I'm working on, things that I'm going to do in my certain days. How am I going to work in my genius? I'm really big at you know getting us working in the areas that we're genius at. Like you're a genius in that certain aspect of your business. And I was saying when we started talking, I said, well, Max, you're this, you know, technical genius. And he goes, yeah, that makes me a technical genius at everything. I'm fixing it your does, Skype problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is great. And so anyways, that's where I use the line. I've always had and on in the back here. Um, you can see up on the top, I have lifetime purpose. I have three year windows one year and quarter goals all the way across in five different avenues of spirituality, relationships, vocation, financial, and social or community. And by having that sense of direction in there, it really keeps me on. It makes making decisions a lot easier because I know where I want to go. And more importantly, sometimes I know where I don't want to go or who I don't want to be with. Right. So yeah. anyways, all right, we can change directions. So I just wanted to get that out for you. No, no, that, that's, that's fine. Actually now, now I want to push further based on that. So <laughs> the, it's an, what you just said there is interesting, which is, you, you know, where, where you want to go and where you don't want to go. And you have that, that vision and focus. Um, I think what's, what's challenging for a lot of people today is they, because they don't have that they then are kind of making it up as they go. And a lot of it's based on what they see and what they see right. looks really good online. Like that, that's something it's, it's always fascinating to me, especially the last few years is 
a, a majority of people are basing their happiness and their success on how other people are deciding to display theirs in a very small exactly. window of time, right? And so it's you if you follow people on Instagram and these social channels, it's it's really easy to start thinking that Wow, I know they said like it's the one percent, but it seems like fifty percent of the population is wealthy, right? It's like just based on everybody's pictures and their traveling and stuff. And what what you don't see is the you know three hundred and sixty four other days, right? You see like one day that they can travel and take pictures and spread that across an entire year, but you don't see as soon as they post that the so you true. know the the financial troubles found that behind their bills the fact that their marriage is in trouble the fact that they're you know have depression or whatever it might be um here's what you think like this has just been something i've been contemplating on like where do we go from here because it's technologically i'm torn because i i believe that this continued innovation is so powerful and that you should never you should never stifle or halt innovation because of negative consequences. Um, I think that's like a slippery slope because that's, pers- you know, it's, it's subjective right. of what's negative. Right. Um, and there's always going to be, you know, externalities, there's gonna be negative impacts, but at the same time, this continued evolution with social media and artificial intelligence and the way people consume their news and their content, it's continuing to silo people and split people. And I think the stat is something like the average, you know, middle school or high school kid has no friend, like one friend or something. It was something it was a really shocking statistic, which this is the irony of social media is they have more friends online than ever, but nobody that actually they have a deep relationship with yeah. and everything's superficial yeah. and everything's surface level. I'm just curious, like, where do you think 10 years from now things are going to be if we continue down this path? Because it does seem pretty, pretty bleak just from people's like ha- overall happiness and satisfaction yeah. with their lives. I think that parenting and is going to be a significant part of it. I just came out of uh, being with my grandkids for three weeks in Minneapolis and I stay at their house and, you know, I a lot, a lot of times sleep in my grandson's room, we have a big bed. And so that's where Bapa, you know, Boppy sleeps. Right. And, you know, the one thing that uh, I really encourage and I'm not afraid to speak up and, uh, and talk about those values. And it's a, and there these kids in a source with this pandemic has even created an even bigger yeah. issue with it. But they're getting some normalcy back in. And I'm I'm a relationship guy. I'm a person guy. This pandemic for me personally has been really, really and it has for a lot of people. I'm not saying it's been worse for me. I'm not competing that way. We use a program in our coaching company called the Colby Corp. And Kathy Colby, she's a brilliant lady. And uh, but she has um, uh, there are three parts of your brain. And, you know, you can go online and go to Colby dot com and you can find out, you know, the great company. The uh, but there you have your cognitive, you have your affective, you have your conative. The cognitive is your IQ, easy, easy to test. The affective is your personality. Those two, by the way, can always evolve and change. But the cognitive energy is your striving instinct. It's really great for people to see that and have an awareness of that. And the the profile comes out. And I won't take a lot of time, but they have fi- fact finder, follow through, quick start implementer. A fact finder, somebody, if you initiate in that, likes to ask a lot of questions. An imp, uh, a follow through is somebody who likes to put things sequentially if you're long in it. And I'll just talk about the if you yeah. initiate in those. I won't talk about the whole thing. Uh, a quick start is if you're long in it like I am, everything is negotiable. In fact, I have a 10, and that's as high as you can go. If, they're, if you're in my life on a regular basis and you know the concept, they'll say the only reason Dave's a 10, it doesn't go any higher. So I am all over the map, and I love people, interaction, change. The implementer is somebody not who implements systems, but if you're longer you are an implementer, that's a more concrete thinker you would be. You would need to see a model and touch it and feel it. If you're a young child and you're a quick start implementer, you will be diagnosed 98% of the time with attention deficit. And the problem is, is that the, you know, the medical community will – you know, take care of that usually using drugs, but it has to be a different learning technique. Reason I like to bring that up is in this social, you know, the social and how important, I mean, like I have these three grandkids. One is just 
super social, has a little bit of a learning disorder as we speak, but I used to have kind of a similar thing when I was his age. So, but he's a hoot and he's up and he's, you know, a lot lot of uh, my son's uh, buddies call him the mayor because he goes, he's going to be a politician because he knows everybody's name. He's out there talking to everybody. And, you know, so this pandemic, the shutdown and not being able to socialize was really hard on him. And my other grandson, yeah, he could take it or leave it. He's pretty tough. You know, yeah, I miss my friends, but they probably miss me more. You know, I mean, so he has kind of that attitude. And then my granddaughter, she's just, you know, just a happy person. And uh, so I think it's one of our biggest challenges that we're going to have as a society is to make sure, because we are human beings. And for me, touch is important. This is great, the technologies, because we're what? 1500 miles apart no you're in florida and so i mean we're 1500 2000 miles apart so we can have a touch we can see each other it's not the same as if we're in the same room together though for me um in that profile i was talking about the colby profile if you're a low follow-through which i am so i resist follow-through and you know that in dealing with me it's really important to give me you know i'll show up but you have to make sure you know, I'm, it's, I know, and yeah. I always show up, but the, uh, uh, and I'm that high quick start, worst profile energy wise that you can have to go through the pandemic. We don't like new rules. There's all kinds of new rules that we're having to adapt to, and it's more complicated, and we love to be with people. We love to, that gives us our juices. Not, it doesn't mean you're, you're an extrovert necessarily if you're a long quick start. I've met a lot of long quick starts that are introverts, but there is a point when they're in their genius where they're doing what really, where them helps them have the income flow in, that's what they're doing. So my, my hope is that um, we're gonna come back to more of a normal. I have a chemical company that actually kills the virus. We have a hand sanitizer, FDA approved, EPA numbers. We're in 14 different countries. We were late to arrive in the marketplace in America, partly just because of all the regulatory stuff and the other stuff. So we're, we're doing some of that now. But, you know, so I probably know a little bit more about that than the average guy because, you know, I'm, we're investing, you know, we have businesses yep. that are, you know, we're all killing it and doing all that stuff. My hope is that you know, there's once we're done with this virus, the bad news is there's probably going to be more. Yep. So as societies, we're going to have to go through that, you know, the balance of it. I going back to your question, I think there's a lot of damage that is being done or could possibly be done by not letting kids be kids and getting them back into school and doing it. So we have to figure I'm not saying put them back in an unsafe way, but we have to the the the. the you know, the kind of the ebb and flow or whatever, the, the, the Zen of it, I don't know what that is, what you call the tug of war that you would have by not doing something, but you, you actually are creating a bigger problem on the other side. And it's a, it's a funny that you would ask that question. Cause when I was with the grandkids, I was thinking about something similar. I'm going, wow, what does their future look like? You know what I mean? Yeah, what's it going to be like? It's hard to, right now there's just no there's no models right and that that's what's challenging you can't it's never happened before in the current society we have so you you can't predict like how does six months plus of isolation for developing children impact their their brain development i mean you don't we don't know because it's it's, yeah it's we can i think we all have a guess that it's not good but we don't know how how serious it is how bad is it like you know, and, and that's that's the challenging thing with this is we're operating so much in the blind with so many things. We're making very big decisions, which, you know, it's yeah, you have to act boldly, but it's also like there's there's a, a lack right now, and this goes on a, a, another path. Like there's a, I'm kind of being a bystander, right? I'm just I'm watching what's happening. I'm I'm staying kind of personally out of it because I don't think there's any upside necessarily to jumping in um but what i what i do notice is a complete lack and this started a few years like with you know politics especially around 2016 we were running everything for our trump coin offer and stuff there's a, a complete lack of the ability for human beings to have open 
authentic discussions where they disagree on something, but still have a yeah. logical, rational, hum humane discussion, right? Where it's just like, let's talk. Right. We can totally disagree totally on everything. Right. We can be on opposite ends, totally disagree, think the other person's completely 100% wrong, but still talk to them and still do our best to understand why they think the way they think, because clearly it's not they're just like, deciding they want to think that way they truly tru truly believe they want to think that way and with what's happened the last few months it's everything i see online is just it is you're either a hundred percent over here or a hundred percent over here right and and that's leading to actions being taken that are very extreme because there's not a lot of people here saying well we can we can relate to this we can understand this there's risks here there's risks here let's let's talk about this let's have all the parties talk about this and come up with a a solution that is taking both sides into it. I don't know. It, it's very interesting. It, it's it's not just interesting. It's sad to see um, the, the yeah. lack of, of communication it, skills. Uh, yeah, and I, you're right on. I mean, the, the part of it is is that you know again we you, we could take political sides here, but here's the thing. I always there's a couple of things. One of my you know it's a, a long time. I think Milton Friedman he died. I don't know, 15, 20 years yeah. ago, he was a great economist, right? Yep. And what I loved about him, he would call he would label himself and back then and, and today and back then it was, you know, quite liberal thinking in the sense of not being a liberal, but I mean, and, you know, just kind of expansive thinking that he had. And it was his biggest thing. And I, and I have remembered this forever. And as a coach and standing, whether again, if I'm in a coaching workshop, our workshops are 15, 20 people typically, or doing a keynote talk in front of 1,500 people. The key thing that I've discovered is it's not important for me to come and say, in our, in our dealings, Max, I'm not trying to convince you to, to embrace my values. I want you to understand my values, and I want to understand yours. But the big thing that happens on both sides, and you know, if we're just looking at two political parties, and I know there are a lot more, but just for the ease, you have the Democrats and you have the Republicans, they're both trying to to cast and force in you know um, their values, their beliefs onto the way you should think. Yep. Right. And what I've had the good fortune of being blessed with is that, first off, I don't try. I try not to do that, because if you're selling, if you're convincing, you're we're always selling. Like I always will say to my you know the the uh, the you know, the, the married couples, whatever you have, your spouses, you have your partners. Again, you, you might be in one of my workshops and I don't care if you're a woman, man, it doesn't matter to me. Right. I mean, it's, it, it's, it goes and however we define all the rest of it doesn't matter to me. I would say that if you're going home and you have this idea that you're, you're going to sell your spouse, your partner on this idea, right. Then you're going to sell your child on the fact that educating themselves and study is good we're always selling we're always you know we're always trying to get somebody you know to you know and when you're a parent it's a natural thing that you're trying to embrace or to to encourage your children to have their own thinking their own values and a lot of times they end up growing up like with your values a lot right and then they'll go off and sometimes they come back and they're totally different than what you are and so that is a big part of the vision side of it. You said something earlier about TV, and I just remembered there is another guy that, uh, again, I've been influenced my whole life. At 16 years old, I started reading success books. I started listening to people like Earl Nightingale, Think and Grow Rich, uh, Napoleon Hill. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to listen to a guy when I was 18 or 19 years old, and his name was Jim Rowan. Died at 92 years old. Um, great motivational speaker. He was one of those guys though that was amazing at it, but probably had a tougher time applying it into his own life. My, this is my view of it than he did in, you know, the lives of other people like me, where it was, it made a huge difference. You talked about the social media, you talked about TV and I, my sense is what, and I learned this at that 18, 19 years old, when I heard Jim Rohn talk about it was he said, remember when you're watching television, you're watching somebody else earn their living. 
should you be working on your own? Because reality isn't in that little box. Real life is outside of it. And to your point earlier, that is another big challenge that we have because our kids are so influenced by it. A lot of the people we're talking with that watch television four, five, six hours a day, seven, I don't know what the average is now, but it's it's way more right now because of the pandemic. But people, I mean, I get asked all the time, are you watching the series Yellowstone or this or another series? And I, I don't watch it, right? And they go, oh, it's so good. You'd really enjoy it. And I go, but I want to have that time to be present with the people I'm with doesn't mean I won't watch you know and not be you know but I'm really select about it and so so that's another challenge with the children because again just recently being with my grandkids guess what they all have iPads iPads. and they're like and I mean I'm talking to them and they're like well you know and I just said look if you want to visit with your iPad or grandpa can go leave a few days earlier I mean and and then they realized that, you know, there's, oh, grandpa will leave if we don't, if we want to just look at our iPad all day, right? And and the parents, you know, my daughter-in-law and son-in-law or son do a great job. And typically they manage that time and the rest of it. But through this pandemic, when you're homeschooling, you're doing all that stuff. I mean, what a challenge for parents. I mean, it's, I mean, word when's their downtime come? You think about, I mean, you just think about the stress that it's going to add to the being, I mean, sometimes, you know, we're in love or madly in love, but, you know, once in a while, you know, in any relationship, you're going to have your challenging times, right? So when my wife, um, when she starts to, you know, uh, you know, like tell me what to do and when to do it and how I should do it and stuff. My favorite line to her is I said, look, look, honey, my, my mom died eight years ago and I'm doing just fine without her. Right. And so you probably shouldn't say that at home and your mom's still alive, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, but and for my, for my case, it, it makes a point that, you know, I mean, um, I'm, I'm capable to make my own choices and decisions and I understand it. You know, sometimes I need a little encouraging just like anybody else, but you know, that side of it. So I, again, I, I, I go off on these other, you know, items like that, but it is a huge issue in this bipartisanship and the, you know, lining up and you can't have a dialogue or a conversation or, you know, it's like, you know, I, you know, I never, I, you know, like I'm a capitalist, I'm an entrepreneur. I would love, you know, I just said, I loved Milton Friedman. Uh, I'm a fiscal conservative. Doesn't mean, you know, I'm more of a libertarian. So I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm easy to get along with, but I also, I value capitalism and I value what that is and what it does for our society. I've traveled, like I said, to 80 countries. I've been to China probably 35, 40 times. I've been to Vietnam, you name them. I've been into a lot of different countries. And like our chemical company, we're really successful down in uh, Colombia. And I go to Bogota. I haven't been there since January once this thing started to hit. But the, um, um, so I've seen, you know, a lot of what works, what doesn't work. And uh, capitalism is a really good thing. You know, but I think the country, to your point earlier, if we don't have a solid sense of direction and values that we're trying to accomplish when we get all I'm not saying we all have to agree with them 100 percent, but we have to have some sense of direction, just like in a business. If you have a business and you don't if you don't know what your what you value, what your mission is and all the rest of it, how are you ever going to have success if everybody just shows up and does whatever they want to do? So, yeah. No, and I don't want true. communism. I live. I've lived over there for a while. That's not what we want, and it's not pretty. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting. This, uh, this, I want to go as far as say hypocrisy, but I, I do always find it interesting and fascinating when a lot of people, especially it's it's, yeah, especially the younger, like you know, kind of my age and younger. Um, where you know a lot of our generation has struggled for numerous reasons and you can look at different factors like we kind of we all you know we kind of went into college came out of college right before the last recession and now this happens we we you know lost a lot of momentum whatever you want to want to call it but i always find it ironic when you have these you know whether it's protests or people complaining on the news about you know our country our systems you know broken doesn't work it's 
the, the very fact that the ra- people are able to say these things and use the tools that they have to get their message out to so many people and build movements speaks to the effectiveness of this, right? You don't That's have, so you don't great. have your, your iPhone or Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or, you know, the ability to, you know, stream a 4k video from the middle of nowhere to thousands of people following you to hear your message, complaining about these things, unless you have those things. And I, I just, it, it, it's always amazing people are unable to see that aspect of it while they're, you know, complaining about the evils of these things. And, and listen, no system is perfect, right? There, there's always flaws. There there's is not a utopian there are, system. There I totally right. But at the end of the day, you know, I would rather operate in a place where somebody with no knowledge, no experience, very few resources could solve it, you know, find a problem and figure out a way to solve it and, build a, a, you know, not just a fortune, but could build, you know, just a comfortable life, right? There's, you can nowadays, you can start a, a, you can say, Hey, I have this really fun design for pet owners that I think is really funny. And my friends like it, I can get a website for, you know, 10 bucks on GoDaddy. I can sign up for, sign up for Spotify. I mean, Shopify for, you know, a few bucks a month and start a free trial. I can link up a free app and I can start selling t-shirts on Facebook and social media for less than a hundred bucks. And I have a business. I love it. And, and that is incredible. Like that, that is, that is such an amazing thing that we have a, a country and a, you know, a world too now where people can do that from anywhere, from anywhere, um, with, with wherever they, their upbringing, whoever they are, their, how much money they have whether they're 90 years old or 15 years old or 12 years old. We, we live in a world where like they have, you know, there's 15 year olds who play video games for a living and make millions of dollars because they have a Twitch account and they stream themselves playing video games and people watch them playing video games and they donate money to them and they get sponsorships. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's crazy. It's, it's yeah. crazy. I it's just, yeah. And, and I don't, I don't know how, I don't think you can ever get to a point where everyone is happy about something, right? And that, that's really what it comes down to because yeah. there's there's always an excuse, right? There's always a, if I don't have something or haven't achieved something, there's always a way for me to to divert blame onto something else. And it's, it's very easy to say, you know, it's the, you know, our free market system or it's this or that. Um, and sometimes there are, you know, there are externalities that, that negatively impact people, right? Um, but yeah, the, the, the capitalism things always interested me just because of the, like the sheer hypocrisy of, of the people that complain about it and the tools they're using to complain about it. Yeah. And I, I do a concept, uh, in our, uh, comic club, one of the workshops I've written was, uh, what's your favorite excuse? And there's a justification model that you deal with, with people. And so, and you may have friends and, uh, that was the other thing Jim Rohn always talked about. You'll be the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Yeah. So choose them wisely. And that's one of my highest values. I'm very good at that. And I'm always filtering in it because I want to have people in my life that inspire me and bring me and help me to, you know, encourage me and I can do the same for them. And the, um, uh, uh, the, what was, where was I going with that? With, uh, with, um, having um the capitalism so i was over in china and this is probably 1989 when were you born 1989 yeah so you were a little guy (laughs) and it was my first trip over there and i remember my friend who brought me over there and i was in Qingdao, china with a company that at the time was probably exporting uh, to the United States uh, over $3 billion. That was a lot back then. They're very big at it. The managing director of that company was a guy by the name, and I called him Mr. Lou, and he called me Mr. Dave. And uh, and we were sitting, and my friend, who had been going there for years already, and he did a lot with the you know, in the where like Home Depot, and he was a uh, you know bring in tarps and different things, and I'm in the mechanical power transmission business. We bring in sprockets and chain, and I just kind of wanted to see what was happening. So, you know, just get ahead of the game, and with and that was ahead of the game. There was there were some people already doing it, obviously, but you know at the time it was, you know, you know being. Uh, out of the box thinking, if you will. Yep. But I remember my friend said, whatever you do, Dave, don't talk about communism. 
right? And um, and so we, Mr. Lou had a good time. We met. There's a long story to it, and you and I can chat about it at some point. The um, uh, but we're sitting at dinner. Mr. Lou chose to have dinner with us again. Very important guy. We always said over there that when you're dealing with important people, our, our code was that they were wired. They were connected to the Communist Party. He took a company that went from ten ten billion ten million dollars of business, and six years later, he was doing three point two billion. That's a lot of you know. That's a lot of growth in a yeah. in a that time frame, right? And so, and I and Tommy said to me, he said, "Buddy, whatever you do, don't say communism." So I sat at dinner, and that the the, the uh, their, their culture, you know, their you know, was to do gambe, gambe, you know, and you'd toast, right? And then you'd bottoms up. My problem is they were doing it with beer. I don't drink beer. And back in those days, you didn't want to drink their wine because it tasted just like vinegar with rubbing alcohol. And it was absolutely horrendous. Um, and so they brought me a bottle of uh, Chevis scotch and they would pour me you know, a bottle or a glass. And I'm like, and then they wanted to gambe. And I had about three gambes and I was pretty much hammered. And I remember turning to Mr. Lou and uh, he said, Mr. Dave, what do you think of our country so far? And I said, you know, I have to tell you, Mr. Lou, Mr. Lou, for a communist country, there's lots of capitalism going on over here. Of course, my buddy kicked me under the table. Mr. Lou looked at me and he goes, you know, you know what I like about you, Mr. David, in broken English. And I said, what's that? He goes, you're an honest man. And I go, yes, I am sometimes too honest. And he said, and then he changed his schedule and we had dinner two nights in a row because we really hit it off. And that sense of it was, yeah, that was working, but it was under control. And there was always somebody watching you, always somebody watching. What I love about here is just your story. You could set up an app or a, you know, uh, get a, you know, the, the payment program and you could be up and selling something this afternoon. It can go that fast. That's incredible. And I love the fact that we have the freedom to be able to do that. So I would say to you, oftentimes people that get, you know, that were the envy, it's one of the worst emotions, envy and jealousy that people can have is that they're envious of you. And so they start to put down what you do because, you know, they're jealous of what you can do with that. And so two things that I've always tried to not be is that, and the other big secret that um, has helped me tremendously um, is letting go of my ego. Really difficult for me because again, back to when we started our conversation, you said, Dave, you know, we're talking about being a kid. I said, my dad left when I was 13 years old. You know, my objective was to just earn a lot of money and I'd have happiness. And I thought money was the solution. And so and I thought being able to brag about it, you know, and just I didn't even know I was doing it. But all I was really pretty much doing was feeding my own my own ego because that's what that needed. And so yeah. I go through a process that that creeps back in. I look at myself and I will challenge all of you listeners to look at yourself in the mirror for five minutes just stare at yourself. I'm telling you, most people are twitching at 20 seconds. But that person looking back at you better be your best friend. And that person you're looking at, you better love that person. And when you can accomplish and achieve that, that's when a lot of magic, a lot of magic in your life will happen. It really does. And I've watched it. And sometimes when I start to, it's, I hate looking at myself for five minutes. That's really hard to do. But when I get out of balance a little bit, I force myself to go back in there and do that. It brings me down to balance. It brings me, it gets me grounded. And I will tell you, there is an old guy, I've used a lot of sayings, but this has been impacted my life. But, oh, the world's greatest salesman by Og Mandito. He said, when you meet a new person, you, when you're shaking, now we'll probably have to fist pump or you know hit each other's elbows or toe kick or whatever we're gonna do. But when you're shaking hands or when you and you're looking that person in the eye, silently into yourself, say I love you. And who is there that will say nay to your goods when their heart fills with your love? I've done it my whole life. And so one of the things I genuinely care about people, I love people, I love the touch, I love the impact and the potential that we all have when we get out of our own way. 
when we start working on ourselves, when we start to take the initiative that who, who do you want to set your goals for you if you're not setting them for yourself? I mean, do you want your dad to call you or your mom to call you? Do you want your wife to set them for you? Or do you really want to see what you really want out of your life? Right. And so I always challenge when people don't want to do it. Who, who do you want to do it for you then? I want to do it for myself. I want to take ownership of that. I want to take ownership of where I'm going and try to get there. You know, the other huge thing about it, and I know you and Jeremy have seen this in your business. You set off with to, for one objective. You set off to do something, right? And you might have success with that, but what you really have success is the byproduct. Because you were doing the one thing, it led to something else, yep. and that's the big home run. So you're in the game, and when you're in the game, byproducts have a tendency to happen. And who do people want to hang out with? They want to hang out with people that are having that that have that energy, you know. And the people that want to hang out with you because you're low, you know, boring, no energy. You probably better take some self inventory and see, you know, what's working and what's not. And that side of it is that that's my biggest thing that I, I got early on is that if I'm going to have success in my life, define it how you want. Success as a dad, success as a spouse, success as a business partner. I have to take ownership of that person. I have to take ownership for my reactions and or my, my actions. And pointing the finger and having the blame game, I don't like that. Yeah. And, I, I, I you know... With that then too, Max, one of the other the other key things as a result of that, and I coach a lot about this, um, and I lead, by the way, I lead this way, is I like to have adult conversation. As a kid growing up, I learned to avoid it. I learned to avoid conflict. And if you're one of those people that came from an alcoholic home or had a, you know, a lot of unhappiness, whatever challenges in your in your childhood, there's a tendency sometimes you will avoid conflict. And I really talk about let's have the adult conversation. And Max, you and I are talking today as we have a couple of hats on. We're talking today as friends. We're talking today as business partners. And some we do some things. You know, I've done your keynote for you at your you know your one your you know your um, mastermind network yeah. group and mastermind group yep. and or one of the keynotes. I wasn't the only one, but the uh, and so we have that relationship going. And so it's really important to know what hat we have on. And so, and for the listeners, I will say, if you're, uh, if you're married or you have a significant partner in your life, you have your relationship partner hat on, right? Then you have, if you're parents, you have your dad hat on, you have your mom hat on, you have that hat on. If you're a business person, you can put that hat on. And so in my case, if I come home, I'm married to Lindsay, and if I come home and I say to, I have my man hat on, and Lindsay has her home hat on, right? We're going to have communication challenges, you know? I'm saying, hey, you look great in that dress. And she's saying, you need to go do this, 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 and she has a list of honey-do list things, right? And so adult conversation is one of the, you know, being present and being able to have that conversation is so important. And again, I always say, Great actions come from great conversations. And and I mean, people go, what's the secret? What's the secret? You know, be there, be present, listen, be real, be likable, you know, and uh, uh, if you do those things, you can have a lot of success, especially if you know your values and you have a vision of where you want to go. Yeah, right? I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. That's uh, uh, powerful stuff. So if if somebody is listening right now, and again, this isn't like, you know, we talked about the beginning, the whole purpose is not to pitch anything, promote anything, but you know, this is something that working on myself and doing a lot of the activities that, that you do in your program has been incredibly beneficial, both personally, and professionally for me. So somebody's listening right now wants to, you know, learn more about what you do and the comic club and, and everything. What's the, the best place for them to, to go and check out, to take that next step potentially. Yeah, well, that's thank you for asking that. That's, um, you know, I'm not uh, a good self promoter, um, great salesperson, but when it comes to doing that other stuff, I, I always kind of not very good at it. And I think it must be a, a you know, subconscious thought. The, uh, the comma club.com, so comma like the, the yeah. um, 
comma, C-O-M-M-A. Um, the uh, comma, we use it for a couple of different reasons, but co- the comma club came, you know, comma, when you're using it in the English dictionary or English, is to take pause, maybe change direction a little bit. And so you can go there. You can go and we have, I write articles probably, I average probably 10 a year, uh, sometimes more depending upon, but for the comma club. And I think there's, you can have access to some of the things I've written on there, some great uh, thinking uh, articles uh, on there. The, um, the one thing I wanted to share too, when you, when you asked that question, it made me think about it. And you and Jeremy have come a long way uh, since I first met you guys, um, especially Jeremy, you were you were further along that path in some ways and, you know, in different ways and different things too. And if Jeremy was on here, I would say that to him. He'll be mad at me that I, Oh, what do you mean? But, uh, the, there's a thing. And for your clients to understand this, and it took me a long time because we have a tendency to do what, when we figure out what we're our geniuses, I call it innate ability or genius. We figure that out and it's really powerful. And I always say money will follow your genius. Money will flow in. If you can figure out a way to play in that game, money will follow. But I will also tell you that people don't value what they don't pay for. Yep. And I want to challenge the listeners to say, you know, you've paid for this call, by the way, or this, you know, this video, the, the stream, in the sense that you're, do, you're, you're, dead, you're putting your time into watching us. So going back to Jim Rowan's talk, you know, watching TV is – you know, you're watching somebody else earn their living. In this case, we're not doing that. We're not trying to increase our living, I guess, indirectly, kind of, you know, we both it might have some impact. And But, but it's not, the, primary it's not the main reason we're doing it, right? It's not the primary reason. And so, but take that out, you guys, when you're listening to this and realize if you take inventory of your business, what you're doing right now, what you're not doing sometimes is, are you getting rewarded for your genius? You need to start getting rewarded. You need to start because you're creating value for people and you know, you need to maybe start charging for it. Right. Is that fair? I don't know if I I was supposed to go there. No, no, I I totally agree. I I think it's, uh, that was something we struggled with early, early on was we were, at least when I was getting started was I wanted to, you know, build a name and help people. And I, I just wanted to help, help, help. And I would give away so much free advice and I would spend, you know, 30 minutes an hour on calls with people and, um, it is a challenging thing to start saying, here's what my, my hour's worth. But when you start right. asking for it, it's, what's amazing is people start paying it and it, then it just builds on itself. And you, you know, people won't pay unless you ask them, right? It's, you gotta, I always, I on sat it. on an airplane. I sat on an airplane going on a long trip. I was coming back from LA to Minneapolis years ago. And then there's a guy, or I was going out that way. I mean, I was heading out that way because the guy with me was going on to uh, Sydney and, uh, he sat next to me, and on, a lot of times on airplanes, if I feel like talking, I will say when people ask you, hey, what do you do for a living? I suppose this is going to change now going forward because we'll have masks on and stuff. But what do you do for a living? I would always say, well, you know, I uh, sell – if I didn't feel like talking, I'd say I sell sprockets and chain because that's what I do. I'm an industrial guy. And usually they'd go, oh, that's interesting, and they turn around and put their head in the book. If I wanted to talk, if I felt like, it, you know, that you know, I didn't feel like doing any work or doing anything, I'd say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur or a coach. I travel around the world helping successful entrepreneurs. I would talk for the rest of the trip. So I sat there with this guy. That's what I said. And the reason I did it because he had his stuff in my space where my feet were and I got into my chair. And, of course, you know, when you're nine million miles or better of flying around, the world, you know, you have your little habits. Yep. And uh, before I said anything, he was on his phone. He grabbed it out of there. said, so sorry, so sorry. I, I didn't mean to do that. I thought it was, you know, and he started to explain it. And anyway, so I sat down. And so when he asked me what I did for a living, I said, I'm an entrepreneurial coach. I travel all over the world doing this stuff. And he goes, wow, that's interesting. And I go, what's your story? He goes, well, I'm heading to, uh, I'm taking on the, the USA. I'm going to be the new vice president of sales in the USA for this electric fence company. And it's actually a pretty famous company. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And he goes, yeah, I'm really nervous about it. I've never met anybody. So I literally sat for the next three and a half hours, laid out his whole master game plan, what he was going to do in the United States, how he's going to do it, how he's going to win relationships over at the factory, how he's going to win the CEO relationship over in the president. And I just told him all this stuff. And he just sat there and he looked and he goes, this is amazing. And I said, I want you to do me a favor. And he goes, okay. I said, 
two favors, actually. I'd kind of like to hear how you did with all this at some point. Not necessary, but if you feel that you could do that, it would be fun to see if this actually helped you. But I said, more importantly, I want you to do something that I didn't do. And he said, what's that? I said, you know what? I do this for, I go around and I get paid for this stuff to do this stuff, right? If somebody paid me $5,000, $10,000, $100,000 and I give them a really bad idea, right? I give them a bad idea. They're still going to try to implement the bad idea because they paid a hundred grand for it. But if I gave that same person a great idea and I didn't charge them for it, they're not going to value it. So value this. Don't give yourself away for free. As you're doing this stuff, you're setting up your program. People, again, I said this already, but people don't value what they don't pay for. So have more respect than I did for my own genius. I just gave it to you for free because you moved your suitcase out of my feet, my my where my feet belonged. Your suitcase was in my way, right? Funny how we do things. So, yeah. um Sorry, I got off on a. You, no, but maybe I have to cut that story off. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. I'm not cutting anything. It's it's all, it's all great and it's all true. So, um, so comicclub.com. We'll we'll put the links and everything in here as so people are you know listening, yeah, watching. That'd be great. They can click it, but um, but yeah, highly recommend it because it's something you know. Uh, I know we're gonna start coming myself and Christopher quarterly. We're I know Jeremy and I were talking about it to start just getting more into it. We've just been so busy, you know, growing and everything. Um, so start joining Jeremy more so we can see each other more and, and dive deeper, That's but, good. but it's a lot of the, the impetus for me starting to do this stuff personally has been from the work that, that we've done and now just implementing it in, in my way, which is great. So I look forward to being able to finally see each other again me too. and spending time together. And, uh, I just want to thank you so much for taking your time and, and sharing some amazing wisdom with everybody. And, uh, we'll see everyone on the, uh, next episode next week. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I know I uh, I have a blast with all these episodes. This is something I really have fun doing. This is a passion project for me. There's no real big agenda here, but I've been getting a lot of requests from people that listen to the show, that watch it, wherever they're watching it, um, for how they can learn more, how they can get into the community, the unicorn community. So I wanted to record this little outro just as a way to tell you more about how you can get deeper into our community, learn more, engage more, build deeper relationships, and, and all that good stuff. But first... If you enjoy these episodes, wherever you're watching, if you're watching it on Facebook, YouTube, if you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, make sure wherever you are, if you like this, give it five stars, give it a thumbs up, give it that like button, wherever you are, right? It's going to be different wherever you are. Write a review and make sure you subscribe so you get the latest episode that drops every week on Thursday. Now, if you want to join our free Facebook group, it's growing like crazy. We now have over 23,000 people in that group. Just go to Facebook and search Marketing Strategies for Business Leaders. That's our free Facebook group. Amazing content in there. We're starting to really build it up and do some cool stuff there. If you want to go further, if you want to invest in yourself, you want to be part of our um, our kind of premium program, specifically to learn advanced cutting edge pay traffic skills, be able to ask me questions on a weekly basis, be able to have me personally review your ads, your funnels, your landing pages, all that good stuff. Go to paid traffic training, all one word, paid traffic training.com. You'll be able to learn all about that program. It's a monthly program, gives you access to both my Facebook courses, private Facebook group. And again, we do weekly calls where I do a 90 minute call with our students and they can ask me anything. I share the latest and greatest stuff that I can review, you know, ads and funnels and all that good stuff. I do audits, Q and A's, amazing stuff. And that's just $97 a month. It's month to month, no long term commitment. So if you want to be part of that, paytraffictraining.com. If you don't, but you want to just be part of our group, go to Marketing Strategies for Business Leaders. That's on Facebook. Just search that. Join our free Facebook group and uh, and join the Unicorn community. And remember, give it five stars. Hit that like button. Hit the 